Well, hello everyone. It is uh, Jeremy, the existential wine guy. I come at you live every one Wednesday at around 5:30 or Pacific Standard Time to uh, wax philosophical about, uh, you know, wine and the experience of being alive through wine. Uh, so we got got a big topic today, so we're going to jump more or less right in. We're going to be talking about uh, the wines of Chianti, Chianti Ciccio, what's actually in it, a little bit of history. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how the Black Russo changed the course of the time of history. And if we have time, we're going to get into some super questions as well. Uh, before we do that, um, I, I was asked by a friend of mine um, who actually is, uh, spent a little bit of time uh, studying existentialism to ask, and he asked me, hey, why existential wine guy? Um, and, uh, you know, I didn't have a really proper answer for him right then and there, so I'm bringing him one now. Uh, well, I'm going to read you the, the definition that we have for it. Um, uh, existentialism is a philosophy, and I'm right, reading this book, so I'm not going to you know, memorize it entirely. Uh, it's a philosophical theory that emphasizes the existence of the individual person as a free agent and, res and a responsible agent. Uh, to, to determine their own development through acts of will. And another way to sort of put that is that we define our own meaning of life. And with wine, especially that has been my journey. Um, I started off drinking, well, like everybody does, we drink our parents' alcohol, and we don't want to have not drinking it from the cabinet. It's what gets served at the table. It's, you know, it's uh, part of the, the, the party of the family. And uh, for me, my father, uh, very deep into uh, the really rich and earthy Cabernet. So if you like the Cabernet, the boy got dirt at the bottom of the glass. And I can appreciate that. Uh, so as I started you know, drinking one in my young or early 20s, uh, one of the things that happened was as I was drinking really just you know, big, bold, and uh, in some cases severe uh, Cabernets, and I was doing kind of like an idiot. Uh, I didn't know what I was drinking. I didn't know that, you know that it was something I even liked. And it wasn't until I started my own wine journey, especially when I went to Italy, that um, I started enjoying wines on a whole different level. I, you know, I didn't have an appreciation for how wines could be, what they could be, the difference in them. Uh, it wasn't until I went to Italy, and I started tasting all sorts of different wines from all sorts of really different regions of Italy. And it really knocked me out. It, it changed entirely how I approached wine. And for instance, I stopped drinking Cabernet, but in favor of you know, the, the Italian varietal, Spanish varietal, Scotch. I, was, I, was just, I just went on this like, whole crazy journey of tasting all these different things. And it's kind of interesting. And now, as I'm a little bit older, I've actually gotten back into Cabernet. So I'm a little bit of that kind of stuff. And so I just did it. So anyway, uh, that's my approach to it. I, it. My journey is not to have an expectation of what I'm tasting. Uh, so let me try to come to me and find my own meaning in the wine itself. So existential wine guy, a small little uh, you know, explanation of where I got the meaning from and how my personal philosophy in tasting and following. So we're going to be talking about Chianti and the region. I've had a lot of uh, questions on that. Uh, apparently, my mic is going bad, so I'm going to do this, and maybe that's going to be a little bit better. And I'm going to talk a little bit loud. Sorry, now I've got a whole lot of the light on the thing. So uh, moving on, we're going to start with uh, what Chianti is. And Chianti is actually a region. And one of the things you'll find uh, when you're um, Exploring wines, especially in Europe, is in America we all the new wines are basically named after the varietal. Uh, that's not necessarily true in Italy and France. In fact, uh, a lot of times you'll have uh, names of wines that are very specifically after a region, and then actually have another great uh, or varietal that's attached to it. A good example is in uh, northern Italy. If you've ever had a Barolo, uh, Barolo is a region, and the wine is actually a Nebbiolo. So in this case, Chianti. Uh, fall more into a pattern of maybe Bordeaux, where Bordeaux is a region and usually a blend of Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot. Uh, in Chianti, the blend is majority, and this is kind of crazy, usually 70 to 80 percent Sangiovese with other wines that are blended with it after the fact. We're going to get into more of that because there's a real history of how that happens. Uh, 
uh, for a little bit of history about the region itself, um, it actually starts with a bit of a story. Uh, there was a fight going on uh, back to this. Well, let me go back a little bit further. The region of Piante is basically almost all of Tuscany. It goes from uh, the central part of Italy all the way to the coast, uh, up north, uh, it doesn't really go that much south, but basically it's right in the middle there. And with the heart of it uh, actually being in um, a seat over it's called like Siena to Florence. And about 800 years ago, Siena and Florence were having a bit of a dispute as where the border lies, uh, each one claiming a little bit more than their share. Uh, using the technology that they had, they came up with a way to uh, sort of finish the argument. They were going to have uh, two messengers start one from Florence and one from Siena. And when the rooster crowed in the morning, those guys would get up on the horses and they would run to each other. And wherever they landed, that would be the new border. Well, as it happens in Siena, they had, uh, this is how the story goes, and this is the same thing about one. So this they can change things, but they can flow. But you know, they're, they're going to have a, a bit of local flavor. Well, in Siena, they had a really fascinating white rooster that they were eating up and the whole idea that that rooster or is fed regularly will wake uh, the rider up at the, at the appropriate time. In Florence it went a little bit different. They had a small scrawny rooster, black rooster, that they kind of starved a little bit. So as you, you, you guess what happened, the hungry rooster gets up earlier and squawks and screams and all of a sudden, boom, the, the rider from Florence gets up and bam! shoots uh, towards the end. The white rooster plugs in a little bit. So the rider got up a little bit later and starts going for Florence a little much later than he should have. As you can imagine, the rider from Florence connects with the rider from uh, Siena, a lot closer to Siena. Uh, in, and as a result, Florence gets much more property. The border is much more in their favor. And as a result, oh god, there's all these people here. As a result, the um, the producers of Chianti, and back then it wasn't it wasn't it was, uh, wasn't even like actually recognized that area. But you know, there was there was a community of uh, wine producers uh, from the Chianti area. And uh, they made the black rooster uh, here at Pamela. They were, they were so happy about it. Uh, that would later be confirmed. Uh, so that was what, around oh, uh, 1384. Uh, in 17, no, no, I'm going to get this wrong. Let's look at this right. In 1716, uh, Cosimo de Machini was the first to actually recognize that small area of Italy as producers of. And that's kind of the, the beginning and the, the, the history of Chianti producers in that particular region. Uh, so, real quick, uh, if you're just joining me, and I see a lot of people here, thank you so much. Uh, I am Jeremy, the Expensive Wine Guy. I'm a food and industry veteran, the new uh, wine industry veteran, who likes to talk to me about wine and I like the history of wine. So it's kind of funny, I was always a history guy, but uh, through wine, I, I've learned so much about the history of our country, Europe, and definitely today, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, the other thing I want to mention before we actually talk about um, what really Chianti uh, consists of, there's one other sort of fantastic story that helps show what Chianti was one is all about, and it really comes after World War II. Uh, after World War II, as you can imagine, Italy is in a huge, is in a tense state. They're, they're just not doing well. Uh, and the, uh, that area is producing wine that is really substandard. Uh, basically, Chianti wine is a majority of Sangiovese and a blend of a couple other wines. So it's usually about 70 to 80 percent uh, now, which is about 70 to 80 percent Sangiovese. And then they just kind of throw other, other things to you know, help define the flavor and the color. And it really depends on the producer and what they're using. It's you know, after World War II, and their resources are really low, so they're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at Chianti. And at this point, it could be any place in any condition, and I mean, white, red, everything. And what they end up doing is producing some really um, lesser quality product overall in general. 
And there's a really a nice uh, side story to this. I, I, we, a lot of people, you know, they think of fancy wine. They think of wine in that sort of like, you know, the bulbous uh, uh, bottle with the straw basket underneath there. And that's romantic and it's cute and, and it all is. But quality wines are so bad that um, the basket is actually called a fiasco. Uh, and as we know, let's uh, go to uh, the internet and let them define a fiasco. Yes, a thing that is a sudden and complete failure. That's how bad the wine was. If the straw basket associated with it, uh, it turns into an idiom for a complete failure. Uh, so one thing that's interesting about that as well is that Wine, the, the winemakers that I've met, and wine producers at all levels, by the way, really strive to make a superior product. Uh, even if you think it's you know, a supermarket wine or a different label, you know, they, you know, wine producers will do their best to try to create something really, you know, as, as good a product as possible. And as, you know, in the 50s, and as it actually dragged on through the 60s and basically the early 70s, uh, there was a group of winemakers that said, hey, we've got to do better. And they did. Uh, they actually created um, a historian of sorts to redefine what Fiance wine was. So all of a sudden, as the years started to follow, all of a sudden, white wine, that's not part of it anymore. Uh, they had to clearly define that it had to be a Sangiovese blend, that the Sangiovese had to be at least, at one point, it was at least 70%. And this is the 75 percent, and then it turned to 80 percent. Um, I just thought that was really interesting that, 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 that these guys recognized that as a region they were failing, and they started doing things to make things better. Um, which is why, you know, now people when they think of Fiance, they also think of Silence of the Lambs, uh, and it's kind of funny how movies affect one. We have the sideways effect that destroyed Merlot and brought Pinot you know, Noir up, and then we have the Silence of the Lambs. That fiance had a really big taste of sale in the years following. So, kind of interesting. Um, well, how you doing? My name is Jeremy. I'm the editor of Clinical Wine Guy. Thank you for joining me. We have a bunch of people. I don't see a bunch of new people. So, Megan, thank you so much. Charlene, always good to see you. Uh, Lauren, Larry, always like it. glad to have you here, especially when we're talking about Italian wine. So, um, uh, so we talked about the quality. Talked about, uh, especially after World War II, we talked about the association of the fiasco uh, and how that became, uh, you know, basically an American idiom for something that's you know, lesser quality or a really, really bad event happening. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Um, I want to talk about the. Um, oh, so we were talking about how winemakers in um, in the in the Chianti region. Uh, and then I forgot to do this. What am I drinking? Well, of course I'm drinking a Chianti. And if you will notice, the little black rooster right there. Um, the little black rooster, I told you that that became the uh, emblem for the uh, producers back in, in, the, in the 1700s. Well, actually, in 2005, the Chianti Classic Wine Consortium also made that their actual symbol. So when you have wines uh, from a very specific, a particular region of the Chianti region, which is that area, kind of you know, like I was saying, uh, Vienna and Florence, um, you, if it's made in the proper fashion, you will see a black rooster on the label. And if it's in red, that's a that's great, and if it's in gold, uh, that actually means that it's a reserve of, that it's actually spent a little bit of extra time uh, in, the, in the barrel and the bottom. And about four years uh, in the barrel, uh, and then uh, you know, they're, you know, from there, I think it has to be in the bottle and at least one to two years before it can actually be sold. So, kind of interesting there. Um, and so, what else do we have here for you? Uh, we talked about the fiasco, we talked about um, the emblem. So, when you're looking for um, Fiante, this is a good uh, little thing to look for. I will also say that um, that black rooster is for a very small part of, let's say, the Chianti Classic, uh, the Chianti Classico, sorry about that, 
you will find because Beyonce is really such a huge nation now, you can find all sorts of amazing Beyonce, not necessarily uh um, those, but amazing ones from all over and it's really kind of a uh, so you, you don't have to rely on the, the, the black uh, rooster. Uh, basically, I found that almost every one from Italy I've ever had has been absolutely amazing. Uh, so you don't have to be stuck on just the Chianti Classicos. Uh, you can have the Chiantes from like the thick grapes from all different parts of those regions, and you can have different coats. Uh, the wine making can be some fun stuff with them. Uh, but getting back to quality control. Uh, as the, uh, the area started enforcing different rules about what could be also considered Chianti, um, it, it worked. You know, it, it really did bring the quality overall up to a whole other level. The only problem is, you know, rules. And the, you know, the, the, the reason that California wines do so incredibly well against, um, ooh, uh, Larry threw me a note, I'm going to read that in a second. Um, there's a reason that California wines do so well in, 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 uh, in competitions against those blue wines. And one of those wines, uh, one of those things is because we have no rules here. Uh, winemakers are absolutely free to do kind of make wines any way they want, and it's completely left up to the, the person who's tasting it and drinking it to really give us the final, you know, yay or nay, or you know, how it kind of feels about it. Uh, and that was actually starting to be a problem in the region. Um, there were a bunch of Chianti guys who were having a really, really uh, hard time uh, with just, you know, making wine in just a certain way. Uh, and so they started rebelling a little bit. And such is basically the, I hate to say the birth of the Super Tuscan, but it's certainly where um, Super Tuscan is really coming to their own. Uh, first and foremost, the Super Tuscan is uh, usually described as an Italian wine made from non-native um, grapes. So you're talking about uh, Cabernet, you're talking about Merlot, and it's basically, you know, again, Italy does such a great job of making wine. They have some extraordinary secret testing. You have these Cabernet, uh, Merlot blends that were sitting off the stops out there made, uh, just soft and just, you know, really different from French wine. It, it, it's, it's a really interesting difference. So again, what happens is one affects the other. These guys start producing these you know, non chianti style wines, these super Tuscans, and all of a sudden, uh, great things are happening. In fact, the super Tus Tuscans, uh, price wise, retail wise, they're uh, doing a little bit better than some of the Chiantes. And to give it credit to the uh, uh, Chianti sort of authority on this, they actually changed some of the rules. So they, they wanted some of that back. So where you were getting maybe uh, some blends of Cabernet Sauvignon and, and, and Sangiovese and all these different things, uh, they changed the rules a little bit to allow what would probably be considered a super Tuscan at some point, uh, allow it to be considered a you know, Chianti or a Chianti in that region. Uh, right now, the, you know, as I read the rules, and I don't, I don't, I, when people ask me, how much research do we do on you know, these hybrid non human broadcasts? Uh, it is a lot. I, I'm usually spending a few days online, uh, going through books, uh, just you know, trying to get the, the fun stories and just the uh, things that we can do and the things that I try to keep the count of out to the community. So, so it's coming up on that. So I'm, I'm going to circle in just a little bit. So anyway, uh, these guys uh, start making these super Tuscans, uh, and they really began to coming into their own, the, the uh, region. Uh, for Chianti, starts changing their rules so they can be, uh, so they can include those in there. And really, just you know, at the end of the day, like I said, they want to produce a high caliber wine. And uh, you know, sometimes you create rules to get people in that direction, and then sometimes you have to just destroy those rules and get them out so people can really flourish. Uh, I'm glad we're at that point because it's the, 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 the Chianti region. Uh, what else do I want you to know about this? Um, we, we talk about Sangiovese, uh, sorry, uh, Chianti basically being a Sangiovese case. So almost, you know, 95% of the time that you are drinking a Chianti, you are having Sangiovese. So uh, 
you can always go to straight send databases as well. Uh, there are some fantastic ones to use in Northern California as well, so they're on our site too, so I can believe. But there's also, again, some extraordinary and convincing uses, obviously, to use some of And also, think about you know, how you're going to be able to share that content. One thing I do with our friends at Acer, uh, almost like Barbera to a certain extent, it is a all standard. I won't say a universal one, but wow, so much good that it, it, uh, you know, it, you know, people, if you want to get friends, you can look at foods from that particular region, and that's kind of where you're going to do uh, things that you might try to learn with it. But across the board, it's, uh, it's a, if you're in a restaurant and you're having a hard time and stuff, uh, Sandra Gacy is a hard way uh, not to get to your friends. So you don't have to do that one at the same time. Uh, let's see who else we have here. Um, Laura has joined us. Matt has joined us as well. Thank you so much. My uh, brother from Mr. Mother, Russ, uh, is on here as well. If you haven't checked out his um, Facebook and Instagram lives, you definitely need to do so. He's the Tilted Fork. I'm sorry, Fork and Tilt. I have that moment. I need more one. Uh, but definitely check him out. He's uh, usually on Thursdays around 5 30. He's doing all sorts of fun things. And one thing I like that he does is he really focuses on the uh, Northern California wine specifically. Uh, El Dorado and Navador County. He's highlighting some extraordinary wineries, uh, sharing great wine, and just you know, goofing off and having a lot of fun. So that's definitely cool. Mm. All right, so we're just a little bit over 20 minutes. Uh, I'm coming, I'm coming in for a landing. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to throw them out there. If I don't get to them today, um, I will uh, get to you. I'll, I'll put them in the replay, and I will get, uh, address them the following. Um, and apparently I'm having some problems with my mic, and I just figured out what it was. For those of you watching on, on Facebook, hopefully that's a little bit better. Anybody? Anybody? There we go. There it is. All right. Um, so I have barely scratched the surface about Chianti wines, but let's summarize just a little bit what you need to know. Uh, if you're looking for a, a Chianti Classico, you are looking for a black rooster. And if you're looking to look for a red or a gold um, circle around, I have a red one right here. And uh, the gold one being the reserve, maybe just a little bit higher quality. Uh, uh, Chiantes are made... Uh, basically with Sangiovese grapes at least 80%, although now um, the region is allowing straight Sangioveses to be considered Chianti wines. So I'm looking forward to seeing just straight varietals from that Chianti region. I haven't tasted any, but boy, I'm, I'm looking for love there. And lastly, a little thing like a black rooster changes the entire course of history for Chianti and for Italy in whole. Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I am the, I'm Jeremy, the existential wine guy. Uh, if you also, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, slap me a note at uh, existentialwineguy.com. And uh, I'm also available for all sorts of fun stuff, whether it be private tastings and education, corporate tastings and speakings, uh, you know, I'm your guy. Anyway, thank you so much. And I will catch you next week. Uh, right here on Facebook and Instagram. Cheers, everybody.